excuses that set the scene for what happens on this Thursday night, leading to the arrest of Jesus, and then, of course, his trial and his crucifixion. So I'd like us to turn to John 14, and uh, we'll read from the first verse. Let's read down as far as verse 14. And this morning, we'll focus on the opening verses of chapter 14, and then tonight we'll turn to verse 6. So John 14 then, reading from the first verse. John 14 and the first verse. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas then turned to him and said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip then said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be sufficient for us. Jesus replied, have I been with you so long? And yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So with certainty I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So let's read those opening verses of John 14 again, the first three verses. And those are the verses we will think about this morning. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And if we take a look at our notice sheet, you can see what we're going to do then with these verses. We think about the structure of the passage. Then we look at the reasons that are contained within the passage. And then we'll focus on the Father's house. So if you want, we have a vision this morning of the Father's house. Do you remember the series we've had since the start of the year? A series about vision, visions of God, visions of Christ, vision, do you remember, of the lost soul? Well, let's add to that then the vision of the Father's house. That's what we'll be thinking about this morning. Let's ask God to help us as we turn then to his word. Lord, we thank you for this lovely day. We thank you for an opportunity of, of meeting together in this building, as well as via Zoom. We commend ourselves to you as we meet. We worship you through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, it's a new week, and we can leave the old go, and we can start this new week by setting our minds on those things which are above. So we commend ourselves 
as a congregation, a different type of congregation meeting here, but also meeting via Zoom. May your blessing be upon us as we commend ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. What I want you to see is that this passage starts with a conclusion. So if you look at the very first verse, that's a conclusion. Let not your heart be troubled. And then what you have is a, uh, an encouragement. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then in verses two and three, you have the three reasons to support the conclusion. So quite unusual then. You normally have reasons and then a conclusion. But here we start with the conclusion. And the conclusion is, let not your heart be troubled. Now, what we need to be clear about is that when Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled, he himself had a troubled heart. Let me show you. Turn first of all to chapter 11 and verse 33. And here we have the death of Lazarus and his two sisters, Martha and Mary. And as Jesus visits them, this is what you read. So first of all, John 11 and verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. So Jesus there has a troubled heart. And yet he says to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. If you turn to chapter 12 and verse 27, you see exactly the same thing. Just move on a chapter then. Chapter 12, verse 27. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came. But look at how that verse opens. Now my soul or my heart is troubled. And then in chapter 13 and verse 21, you have exactly the same. So this is on the same night that he says to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. Just a few moments earlier, he says this. Chapter 13, verse 21. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in his heart and testified and said, he's thinking about who will betray him. Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. So can you see then that Jesus himself has a troubled heart? And I guess we know what's troubling him. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be put on trial and then he will die on the cross. Now that's enough, isn't it, to trouble any heart. So when he then turns to the disciples and he says to them, let not your heart be troubled. Do you think that he is being hypocritical, saying one thing and experiencing another? Or do you think what we need to do is understand what he means? So when Jesus says in chapter 14 and verse 1, let not your heart be troubled, let's be clear what he doesn't mean. He doesn't mean don't let it start because his whole own heart was troubled. So he can't mean then, can he? Never allow your heart to be troubled. Don't let it start. He doesn't mean prevent your heart from being troubled. What he seems to me to mean is this. When your heart is troubled, do this. And so his own heart is troubled. And so we can say that he knows what a troubled heart feels like. And if your heart is ever troubled, Jesus understands perfectly because, as we've seen, his own heart was troubled. 
And so what he says in verse 1 is, when your heart is troubled, this is what I want you to do. So look at verse 1 again. Let not your heart be troubled. So when your heart is troubled, do this. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now that single phrase has caused a lot of debate. And it seems to me it means this. He says to his disciples, you're used, aren't you, to listening to God? Well, if you are used to listening to God, Listen to me also. Listen to me, because I am God too. So put that verse together, and this is what Jesus says. When your heart is troubled, listen to Jesus, because Jesus is God. That's what he's asking his disciples to do. And that's what I want us to do this morning then. Let's listen to the words of Jesus, especially if we have a troubled heart. It's okay to have a troubled heart. You can't stop your heart becoming troubled. Even Jesus had a troubled heart. So it's fine to have a troubled heart. But when you do, don't let that continue. Instead, listen to the words of Jesus. That's what we have here in this passage. And these words have three reasons why your heart doesn't need to continue to be troubled. What are those three reasons? Well, you see them then. First of all, in verse two, the first reason why your heart does not need to be troubled, is in my Father's house are many mansions. That's the first reason. Now, the word mansions, it's an old uh, word that means a permanent dwelling. It doesn't mean a big house. It means somewhere permanent to live. And so the first reason why our hearts do not need to continue to be troubled is because we have a permanent dwelling in the Father's house. Now we're going to say more about the Father's house in a minute or two. But at this point, just take the idea that you have a permanent dwelling in the Father's house. And as you think about that, as you believe those words of Jesus, your troubled heart will find rest in that idea. You have a permanent dwelling in the Father's house. That's reason number one. Reason number two, then, is found in what Jesus says next. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, what I want to do is bring in a couple of contrasts so that it, this makes sense to us. Jesus gives us reason number two, the idea that he is going. And he's going to prepare a place, a permanent place in the father's house. Do you notice what he doesn't say? He doesn't say, I need to prepare you for the father's house he says i am going to prepare the father's house for you so there's nothing here about the need for us to be prepared for us to get ready or for us to be better to improve to sort things out to get right nothing like that at all in fact, Jesus says that we are already clean. If you look back into chapter 13 and verse 10, when he has taken his clothes off, he's dressed in a towel, he wants to wash the feet of the disciples. And Peter says, Lord, don't just wash my feet, wash all of me. And Jesus says, you are already clean. 
So what that means is we're already ready for the Father's house. Nothing needs to be done to us to get us ready for the Father's house. In fact, Jesus is going to get the Father's house ready for us. So it's to prepare a place because we are already clean. He's going to make the Father's house ready and not us ready for the Father's house. Now, I want you to see that included in this idea is the cross. So Jesus will go to the cross and going to the cross is preparing a place for us in the Father's house. So later on that night, when he will be arrested and put on trial and sentenced to death, and the next day, he will then carry his cross through the streets of Jerusalem and be nailed to that cross outside of the city. All of that is Jesus preparing our place, our permanent dwelling in the Father's house. And that's what he's about to do. So when your heart is troubled, what helps us is the thought that Jesus is getting a place ready for us. We are not needing to get ready ourselves. He is preparing a place. That's reason number two. And then take a look at reason number three. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now that's reason number three. So let me remind you, reason number one is in the Father's house, I have a permanent dwelling. Reason number two, why my heart shouldn't continue to be troubled, is Jesus prepares that place. He's preparing my place. He's getting my place ready. And that includes going to the cross. And then thirdly, he will come again and receive me to himself. What's included in that idea? Take a look at verse three. I will come again. Now, there's two ideas there. The first is the resurrection. So when you come to chapter 20 of John and Jesus has been raised from the dead, that's him coming again to receive his disciples, to welcome them, and to welcome them to the Father's house. So first of all, then, it's the resurrection. But also in that idea is the second time that he comes, what we call the second coming. So when my heart is troubled and I think about my permanent dwelling in the Father's house, that's my dwelling prepared for me, prepared for you by Jesus himself, my troubled heart knows that there will be a time when Jesus will come again and he will receive me and take me and show me that permanent dwelling that he has got ready for me. Those are the three reasons that we have here in this gospel. And I think that these three reasons also help Jesus with his troubled heart. Because we've seen in chapter 13 that just moments earlier, at the thought of Judas, his own heart was troubled. So he then thinks himself of his father and his father's house. He thinks about why he's going to the cross. He's going to the cross to prepare a place for those he loves. And he's thinking about his resurrection and his return. And so as he uh, comes to the cross, his thoughts are about coming again. And so we see Jesus soothing his own heart in the same way as he wants you and I to soothe ours. So let's think about then what this idea of the Father's house is. I want us to roam about a bit in this gospel. 
And I want you to turn back to chapter two. So early on in this gospel, then, we have a reference that's going to help us make sense of what is going on. I want us to read from verse 13. So this is chapter two of John, reading from verse 13. And as we read these verses, take note of what the Father's house is. So John 2, 13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. Now note the next verse. He said to those who sold doves, take these things away do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. So the very first thing to notice is my father's house in John 14 is first of all a reference to the temple, the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, you know, I'm sure that in chapter two, it's the Passover. Chapter 14 is also the Passover three years later. And so the first thing that you and I need to think about is this. If I have a permanent dwelling in the Father's house, I think about the Father's house like the temple in Jerusalem. It's like that building where God met with his people. First built by Solomon, then rebuilt after the return from Babylon. And now a third time, built by Herod, that building with sacrifice and priests and the holy place, that is a vision of the Father's house, God in the midst and his people around. Now keep reading then, John 2, verse 17. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house, has eaten me up. So when they see Jesus cleansing the temple, they remember this psalm that spoke about the Messiah's zeal for the Father's house. So there's a second uh, reinforcement there, if you like, of the idea that the Father's house is the temple in Jerusalem. Verse 18. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now there's a change happening here. The Jews said it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in, the, in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Now do you see the change in idea? First of all, the Father's house is the temple, and that's easy. All of us can grasp that without any difficulty, that that temple is a representation, symbolic of the Father's house, which is heaven. But then here we get this idea that the body of Jesus is the Father's house, that his body, which he will raise up on the third day, is the house of his father and in the father's house we will have permanent dwellings so there's a sense here in which john is saying that jesus taught his disciples that we have a permanent place in him that we are joined to him that we are one with him that we belong to him if you want that we are in christ and to be in Christ is to have a permanent dwelling in the Father's house. That's what seems to be going on here. So that's John chapter 2. That's the very early teaching about the Father's house. If we go on a few chapters, you'll see another uh, couple of verses to help us understand what the Father's house is. Turn to chapter 8. Chapter 8. 
and uh, we'll read from verse 31. So now John 8 and verse 31. Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus then replied like this, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Do you notice that verse? Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. There's a reference there to the house. Do you notice it in that verse? Verse 35. A slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Now that house is the father's house. It's the same temple. It's the temple of his body. And what he says here is that his truth sets us free. And we are free like sons. We are not slaves, but we are free like sons. We are sons and daughters of the living God. And a couple of things come together in chapter eight. We'll see a bit more of it tonight, hopefully. But what I want to emphasize here is this. We've got troubled hearts. We don't want to do nothing. We don't want just to let our troubled hearts run riot. We are not going to be victims of our troubled hearts. We are not going to allow our troubled hearts to grip us and keep hold of us and, and destroy us. We are going to bring the words of Jesus to bear on our troubled hearts so that they are troubled no longer. That's what we're doing. So the first thing is, I've got a permanent dwelling in my father's house. That house was like the temple. The temple wasn't permanent itself. I've already told you, it was destroyed twice before the days of Jesus. And then shortly after the days of Jesus, it was destroyed again, three different temples. But we have a heaven that the temple reflected, which cannot be destroyed. That Herod's temple was destroyed after the days of Jesus and never been rebuilt. We have a heaven, a father's house that the temple symbolized, which can never be destroyed. Think back to last Sunday morning. We have a, an inheritance reserved for us, kept by the power of God. So on this earth, things get destroyed, even the greatest things. But my troubled heart knows that heaven can never be destroyed. And I have a permanent place there. And this tricky idea that the Father's house is the body of Jesus, well, think about that then. Let your troubled heart dwell on the fact that Jesus was betrayed and arrested and sentenced to death. And on the cross he died, but he was raised from the dead. Death couldn't hold him. Sin couldn't defeat him. The devil could not destroy him. Jesus rose in victory and in power. So my troubled heart believes in one who was dead, but is alive. And he's been given a name which is above every name. He is at the Father's right hand where he prays for me. And he remembers when he prays for me that his heart was once troubled, like mine is now. And so he can pray for me. And he's exalted and he's glorified and he's triumphant and he's victorious and he will come again. 
So my troubled heart hopes in one who was dead, but is alive, alive forevermore. And so my troubled heart knows that he's going to come again. He's not going to get me ready. I'm already ready. But at the right time, when things are ready for him, he will come. And he will come and receive me and take me and show me and settle me down in that permanent dwelling in the Father's house. He himself will take me by the hand, take me into the Father's house, show me where my permanent dwelling is, and there I'll be. So that where he is, I will be also. He's going in chapter 14 to be separated from his disciples. And we are separated from him at the moment. But just imagine what the reunion will be like. Imagine what it will be like to finally see him, the one in whom you've believed all these years, the one whom you've read about in the Gospels, the one that you've prayed to with your eyes closed. You'll see him. And when you finally see him, you will be with him. So that where he is, you will be. You'll be inseparable. Is that the word? Inseparable. From Jesus Christ. You will be together with the Lord. And then what your troubled heart needs to think about is this. When you're in the Father's house, and when you're in that permanent dwelling, what will it be like for you? You will be a son. So you won't be in the Father's house, living in that permanent dwelling like a slave. You will be living in that Father's house as a son or a daughter of God. And you'll be like that permanently. You'll be like him, Jesus permanently he is a son you will be a son or a daughter you will have the same status the same recognition the same place as jesus himself that's what it will be like for you and it's his truth that has set you free from slavery and made you a son or a daughter of God. Now, what will it be like to be in your father's house, to be there permanently, and to be living as a son or a daughter of God? Now, that is the words you need to hear when your heart is troubled. And so we conclude, as, as John does here, let not your heart be troubled. You're used to listening to God. Well, listen also to me. Take these reasons, apply them to yourself. And as you apply them to yourself, then your troubled heart shall find some rest. Let's pray.